Hello, my name is David and welcome to this behind the scenes video covering the third episode of my Dinosauria series, A More Ancient Sprang. In this video, I'll be going over the artwork behind the film, how I animate this series, the scientific accuracies, inaccuracies, and also the production of this big honkin' sculpture I made for the film. So, let's get started. started this Dinosauria series, A More Ancient Spring was one of the first ideas I came up with. I actually started work on this film about two weeks after starting Old Buck, all the way back in January. I have been working on this film, on and off, for 11 months, and it went through a very tough production. As you can see, some of the early work on this project looks a whole lot different from the final product. <laughs> The name of this film, A More Ancient Spring, is a reference to what is widely regarded as the first properly recognised piece of paleo art, Duria Antiquior e More Ancient Dorset by Henry de la Beche. This is an almost 200 year old watercolour painting that depicts a whole Jurassic ecosystem featuring a large collection of species all discovered by Mary Anning on the English coast. Inspired by this piece, I wanted to create an animated short film in the style of a watercolour painting, and bring more focus to the changing season and the ecosystem around our main character than I have in my previous films. And instead of Jurassic Dorset, I chose to set my film in the Dinosaur Park formation, which is in Alberta, Canada. Every single drawing I did for this film in my sketchbook is a watercolour and pencil painting, all serving as stylistic reference for the look of the final film. You'll notice that a lot of my earlier drawings have very minimal backgrounds, the animals sitting in a small bubble of their environment in an otherwise blank void. This is actually the look I originally planned on replicating for A More Ancient Spring. I used this shot here as an art style test, drawing multiple backdrops to see what worked. But after about four or five passes of this, I really wasn't happy with this minimalistic style. In fact, even by the end of my sketchbook, you can see a far more detailed fuller art style emerge that far closer resembles the final film. I have been making large clay sculptures for each of the films in my Dinosauria series, and for this film I decided to sculpt a father, Lambiosaurus, looking over his nest. Using Daz air drying modelling clay, I rolled out a big jab of the hut looking sausage, I added legs, added arms, waited for it all to dry, and then I had a solid base to do all of the finer detail work on top of. This is the third sculpture I've made for this series, and it was without a doubt the easiest and quickest of the bunch. Most of my sculptures, because of their complicated standing poses, have seemingly endless nooks and crannies and undersides and topsides and backsides to worry about. They have to be sculpted slowly, in planned out, patient steps. But because this sculpture is lying down on its side, this really wasn't much of an issue. I also didn't have to worry about any structural support, and with almost half of the animal against the ground, I didn't have to sculpt or paint that side at all. This final world, he 
keeps spinning around. I really, really like the look of this Lambiosaurus sculpture. It looks like springtime to me, and I think it's a really wonderfully serene piece. I think that the colour scheme from the animated short film has translated particularly well into sculpture form. That that gradient from green to brown to orange to grey-blue is, is captured pretty perfectly. Here is my finished Lambiosaurus sculpture next to my Troodon mother and my alpha male Styracosaurus. Filling out this sculpture family has been one of my favourite parts working on this Dinosauria project and I think they're all looking pretty fantastic together so far. This film takes place in what is now Alberta, Canada, and follows a male Lambiosaurus during the spring mating season. Our male Lambiosaurus picks up a courting gift for his mate, as all of the other hadrosaurs in his herd begin pairing up as well. Before he can reach his mate though, she is killed and dragged away by a Gorgosaurus. Now he calls endlessly into the night, the last Lambiosaurus in his herd. All the other creatures in the ecosystem are pairing up in their own unique ways. Even the supposedly villainous Gorgosaurus made the kill to court a mate of its own. As the spring season reaches its end, our lonely Lambiosaurus is on the edge of giving up, until miraculously he finally hears a reply to all of his calls. Forgetting his gift, he plunges into the foggy unknown in search for this other lost soul. He confronts and conquers one of the very predators that took his first mate, and triumphantly emerges on the other side. And on the other side, is another herd of hadrosaurs and another lonely Lambiosaurus, who is bearing a courting gift. Now, I know this film won't be everybody's cup of tea, because it is a little bit more fantastical than the rest of this series. There's still a lot of very realistic courtship behaviour here, and, and lots of little interactions that are based on direct fossil evidence, but the film also has a lot of blatantly unreal elements as well, with a metaphorical fog representing the limits of our main character's world, a highly personified main character at that, and a general filmmaking that suggests a much more heightened reality than the previous two films. I personally love it for all of these elements because this film was in fact conceived as a minimalist, fantastical, surreal love story. And after this film's rather troubled 11 month production, I'm really glad to see some of its original DNA is still in there. My animation process for these films is split in half. I have the 3D animation work and the 2D animation work. All of the complicated characters and most of the animation itself is 3D animation and it's done in Blender. These are three-dimensional models that are rigged and animated in 3D but textured to look as two-dimensional as possible. Once a shot looks something like this, I then move on to the second half of my animation process, the 2D work that's done in Photoshop. This entails drawing all of the static 2D background and foreground elements, as well as whatever extra 2D animated elements are required for this scene. 
The 3D half of this film was relatively straightforward, I've done this before, but the 2D half is what I want to talk about here. These are easily the most colourful and varied and detailed backdrops I've ever made for an animation. I think this is probably the prettiest film I've ever made and it's because of these environments. So it might surprise you guys to know that drawing these 2D backdrops for each and every shot, I have never enjoyed doing. I have no artistic interest in landscapes or scenery or anything like that. And the focal points of almost every single one of these shots are the 3D animated elements. So when I sit down to paint a 2D backdrop, I'm not really painting a traditional piece of landscape art. I'm literally painting everything that you, the audience, are not supposed to be looking at, which is not very fun. This is my film, though. I could have made these backdrops easier. I originally planned on making them easier, but I decided not to. I decided to make them the hardest backdrops I've ever done, and I'm really, really glad that I did, because this doesn't look nearly as good as this. Watching these behind-the-scenes videos might make my creative process look like non-stop fun, but it's not. A, a lot of this is boring and tedious and frustrating work. Not all of it, but a decent chunk of it. But my point is, that's inevitable, and the work is almost always worth the effort in the end. This short film features three hadrosauroid dinosaurs, all three being very closely related lambiosaurines. Parasaurolophus, Carithosaurus, and, of course, Lambiosaurus. There was a fossil bone bed that was found in Alberta, where this film is set, that was found to contain not only Lambiosaurus remains, but also the remains of at least four other hadrosaur species, suggesting that these animals may have lived in mixed species herds, which is what I decided to depict in this film. The crests of all of these lambiosaurine dinosaurs are very distinct from one another. They were all full of hollow chambers and were likely used to make sound. Now, if these animals were living in giant multi-species herds, this every single time, every single time. <laughs> If these animals were living in giant multi-species herds, this explains a lot. A large, elaborate, unique head crest that makes a specific sound depending on what species you are may have been their only real way of telling each other apart during the mating season. Lambiosaurus lambi is the star of the film and is one of my favourite dinosaurs. This species first appeared in my old buck short film, as both films are set at the same time, in the same place. Carithosaurus, though, I think might not belong here. This animal is known from marginally older rocks than Lambiosaurus, but the difference is so slight that I think that it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that these animals crossed over at some point. I decided to depict all of my hadrosaurs as sexually dimorphic, all of the females being slightly less colourful and having smaller crests than the males, which you often see in nature today, especially in birds. I did a lot of bird watching for reference while working on this series, and you'll see similar mixed species groups coexisting at ponds today in the form of ducks and other waterfowl. Each of these species looking elaborately different from the next to help tell each other apart. Some, like the mallard duck, even being sexually dimorphic as well. 
In fact, the colour scheme for my Carithosaurus was based on the mallard duck. Male mallards are elaborately coloured with green heads, while the females are just plain brown. I think I may have finally become their king. <laughs> Eagle-eyed viewers may have also noticed this particularly beaten up Parasaurolophus in the film. This particular animal is based on the holotype specimen of Parasaurolophus walkeri, ROM768, who had a bunch of injuries including some broken ribs and a broken, heavily dented spine which was likely due to a tree falling on him, an injury that this animal survived, healed from and just lived with. Sound likely played a very large part in these animals' lives, and it certainly plays a big part in this film. In 1997, reconstructed dinosaur calls were created by pushing air through a model skull and resonating chamber of Parasaurolophus walkeri, and I made sure to use those very sounds in my film. But I had to create all of the other sounds myself. The calls that my Lambiosaurus make were created using mostly my own voice. First, I recorded one of these. <sighs> then I recorded a deeper one of these. <sighs> and then finally, whatever this is. Add all of that together, slow it down, add some bass, add some reverb, and throw in the sound of a grumbly camel, and you get this. Which I think is a decent enough guess as to how these animals may have sounded. The last few animals featured in the film are Chasmosaurus, Euaplocephalus, and Gorgosaurus. Chasmosaurus is a Chasmosaurian ceratopsian and my designs are, again, sexually dimorphic, with the males having a slightly more colourful frill display than the females. The animal also has a row of quill-like bristles running down its tail. These bristles have not been directly found on this species, but instead Cetacosaurus, which is a very basal Ceratopsian dinosaur which Chasmosaurus is distantly related to. Moving on to Euaplocephalus, this is an ankylosaur and was easily the most frustrating animal to research for this film, as the genus was split up and jumbled about a couple of years ago. This design is what I came up with based on the new separated specimens, and I think my depiction here is accurate enough, but I could easily be wrong. In the film, my Euaplocephalus is seen digging a hole to rest in and protect itself, which is behaviour that's been speculated in ankylosaurs for a very long time. Serendipitously, while working on this film, there was a discovery of an ankylosaur in Mongolia just a few months ago, I think, that seems to have confirmed this with the way its front feet were shaped. And finally, we have the Tyrannosaur, Gorgosaurus liberatus. One of my favourite little details in this film is regarding my Gorgosaurus. While trying to court the female, my male Gorgosaurus scratches at the ground with his feet. You can't quite see it, but you can certainly hear it. This is based on multiple trace fossils, in this case footprints, from all around the world of different theropod dinosaurs, all standing in place and raking at the ground, sometimes even in groups. This is almost certainly a courtship display, and is not dissimilar to what a lot of modern birds do today during their mating dances. Yes, my disciples, feed. I brought food. It was important to me from a filmmaking perspective that there really shouldn't be a bad guy in this story. 
At first, the Gorgosaurus is framed as a straight-up villain, killing and dragging away the female Lambiosaurus. But as the film progresses and all of the peaceful animals start courting each other and pairing up, it's revealed that the Gorgosaurus made the kill to court a partner as well, and this kill will help this female mate and nest and raise her young. By the middle point in the film, during the springtime montage, the Gorgosaurus is no longer framed as a villain at all. She's now doing peaceful things with the other peaceful animals, portrayed as just another natural part of the ecosystem, as she should be. A More Ancient Spring has been the toughest film so far out of the entire series. A lot of this film was reanimated and rewritten, and I even totally gave up on it and cancelled this film for at least two months. Deleted scenes include this scrapped alternate opening with a slightly different art style, this Euaplocephalus scene too was redrawn and reanimated for the final film, and there are a ton of other unfinished or unused shots, including this one of the Gorgosaurus kill at the beginning. I even made a somewhat finished extended ending sequence that I had to delete from back when this film was a far more surreal film as well. Every single one of my animated short films goes through changes. They all have deleted scenes and unused shots and test animation, but rarely of this scale. The film certainly has a bunch of scientific inaccuracies, too. These cat-like postures of my hadrosaurs are anatomically improbable, there's grass everywhere, which may or may not be accurate, and I I don't think that a Lambiosaurus pair would still be up for mating after so much springtime has passed that some of the other animals in the area are already laying their eggs. But these scientific inaccuracies are in a short film that was conceived as an abstract, bittersweet love story about a lonely and lustful horse lizard who flees from his home, faces his biggest fears, and triumphantly finds true love on the other side. So. Do inaccuracies really matter at that point? This film took 11 months to make, but that's because it didn't have my constant attention. I've been working on all five of the Dinosauria films at once. When this film got too stressful, I would take a break from it and work on one of the other, smoother films in the series for a few weeks which is why it took so long. A more ancient spring should be an absolute mess, but I really don't think it is. I am quite surprised at just how tonally consistent this all ended up being. I actually like this film quite a lot. I think it's gorgeous and immersive and serene, but bittersweet as well. After going through a lot of changes, I don't think I would change anything else in this film if I had the chance. I think it's finally done. Thankfully, the next film in this Dinosauria series, at least so far, it's obviously not finished yet, has been a far simpler affair. If you guys want to read through the sketchbook I've been showing off in this video, you can. High resolution photographs of the entire Dinosauria series so far are up on my Patreon page right now. Support me over there and you'll gain access to the sketchbook, frequent updates on upcoming projects, and two weeks of early access to my animated short films. It's also, by far, 
the best way you can support this Dinosauria series as well. Thank you all so much for watching. But it is the end of the video now and that means that I have to leave my house again <laughs> and record some b-roll for the outro. It's actually starting to get really dark outside now so I really better hurry. Special thanks to all of my top Patreon supporters on screen right now. Scrolling over some probably super grainy and dark and ugly footage of some mushrooms or ducks or trees? Wherever I decide to run off to after I stop recording this. This Dinosauria series exists because of these supporters and I really cannot thank you all enough. Bye guys. <laughs> Alright, that's enough. I'm gonna feed you.